ladies and gentlemen, the Irish history detective, our own Irish bard, Jeanette Walsh. Thank you. Well, this is a real honor for, for me to be here. And Wolf Island and Kingston was only something that was written in obituaries and family history. So um, I'm the first member of my family to return to Wolf Island. And my niece, Naomi, is the second member of the family. So it's a real honor. And there's a phrase that I, I've heard when I was in Ireland that the Irish like to say, and maybe it's a Wolf Islander thing too, I don't know, but you are all very welcome here. And this picture was actually taken, uh, I think the, the September 1st or 2nd when I arrived back on the island. And actually September uh, 1st when I got out of the car across from the whip and in front of uh, Spork Cottage, I heard my name being called. <laughs> someone knew my name, it was someone from the hotel, and, I, and I, I'm, I was sure they didn't mean me. And sure enough, it was someone I knew, so uh, welcome. <laughs> so just briefly, uh, where I live is a, it's called a city, but it's actually a village. It's, it's Murdoch, Minnesota. And yes, that is me, well, sitting, not, uh, sitting out in my field. So uh, this is one of the farms that's been in our family uh, for a long time. My, my grandfather bought it actually before they bought the house that I live in today. So this is, uh, obviously this is after harvest and uh, there's a couple of these big mounds of stones, and that's just one of the one of the corners. And uh, where I live is in uh, it's called Dublin Township in Swift County, Minnesota. And there's other uh, names. Uh, they're also influenced by the Irish. Uh, like nearby is Kildare Township, and uh, and it goes on from there. So, yeah. Uh, and the, the crops that you'll find in my particular area are soybeans and corn. So it, it just rotates in that particular field. And no, I don't live on a farm. <laughs> I live in town. <laughs> so this is Thor Cottage. Yep, I was actually, wait, when I, I, ha I took the photo at Christmas time it's either like right after the storm, the, the, excuse me, the blizzard or before, I'm not sure, but I was actually waving to someone and that's, I, I really like that. Uh, why I really enjoy staying in Spore Cottage and, and um, being there is that this, this house was built in 1870. So that means that my family saw this cottage so maybe they visited the spores or, you know, I, obviously I'll never know, but you know, the, the floors aren't even and it's just, uh, it's really nice to be able to experience something that was around at the time that my, our family, the Walsh family was here. Um, since I've arrived, the first time to Wolf Island, I've, I've put together that four generations of my family have lived here. And about a total of 13 babies born. That's from my great-great-grandparents and then my great-great-grandfather's first son, Patrick. And Patrick also had a farm and my great-great-grandfather, uh, out on Seventh Line Road, north of Baseline, and a farm that uh, just north of now Judy Greenwood's uh, or family's farm is the Walsh Farm, and you'll find it uh, on the map. I think it's the 1878 map, and or so uh, is Lot A, 100 acres. So 
when uh, I saw it from a distance uh, at Christmas time and, and, and did get to see part of the farm this time. And then the, the other farm, Pat, the Patrick Walsh farm out on Irvine, uh, or Irvine, which is it? Irvine. Irvine. Yeah. <laughs> out by Irvine Bay is, was the Pat Walsh farm or Patrick Walsh farm. Uh, not as many details are known about that particular farm, but I think there's about uh, six or seven homes or subdivisions in that in that area now. So it'd be uh, Holiday Road and and uh, uh, Helen's Road. I think it's Helen's Road. I could cut, I have it wrong. Um, there is one family member or one known family member uh, that is buried here on the island, and it's someone I. I had never heard of. She was not in any family records or obituaries, and it would have been the the, the woman that should have been my great great grandmother. Uh, she died uh, in 1857. Her name was Mary Moran, married name Walsh, and she died uh, in 57. And then later in that year, my great great grandfather marries again to a woman named Catherine Summers and they get married at the cathedral. I'll, I'll be showing you some of those documents. Oh yeah, it's Four House. It's a little hard to see, but if you go by there today, uh, it looks like that, more or less. And again, Spore Cottage is actually behind this storefront. So it's a 1910-1915 photograph. From, the, from your historical society, by the way. And there's my grandfather. So 1948, Martin J. Walsh Sr. And it was taken by my father, Martin Jr. And pretty much everything in that photograph could be recreated today, uh, except for that chair. I don't think I have that chair anymore and those other chairs, and the sheet music is probably under the piano bench. And he was the first born in the United States, and his father was born here on the island, uh, Michael Walsh Jr. And he was the first in a series of eight. So that's uh, Grandpa, and according to one of my aunts, Aunt, Aunt Agnes, told my brother Paul that uh, he did have a very distinct accent that at times you could catch things that were Irish but I'm thinking you know if I had a recording of that it might sound something like you here <laughs> Wolf Island and my father had some sayings that were di very distinctive So there's my grandparents, grandpa on the on the right there and grand, and my grandmother Jenny. So her name was officially Mary Jeanette Jenny and then her Foley and Walsh. I've actually traced her family line back to two farms in Ireland. Unfortunately, not with the Walsh family. I I've I, I can't and, and, and probably never will, and I'll be showing you why in a little bit. So these are a few family photographs. Um, the, the large photo in the center is Catherine Summers and M Michael Walsh Sr. And that photo was taken in Minnesota. Uh, uh, not too late, or not too long after the, they, they pass away. Uh, and then there's another photograph. I'll show you a little bit more detail. So just to the right, that photo was likely taken in Kingston or Wolf Island, but I don't know if you had a photographer here. I'm mean, sure services were probably at Kingston. And that's, those are two of the uh, earliest photographs I have, and there are copies, so um, they're not the best, but they're pretty good. And 
So there's the photograph of my great great grandparents, and they're actually buried in uh, DeGraff, Minnesota. It took me 10 years to find their grave in Minnesota because it, it was hard to read the inscription, and I tried to get help at the church, and no one could knew where it was, and it was only marked on one side, so uh, mark your gravestones on both sides if you're going to do a monument. Um, I'm going to show you their marriage uh, record. So this is a portion of the marriage record, or this is a record from the, a large book from the Kingston Cathedral, and they married in November 2nd of 1857, but not too many months earlier, Bridget passes away and buried at the Old Cemetery in, in, uh, here in Wolf Island. And this is when there's a mention, where the first mention of uh, that uh, there's a Bridget Moran deceased of Long Island. Okay, I, when I read Long Island, I didn't know that that was one of the many, many, many names given to Wolf Island. And I was searching high and low. And, you know, there are so many islands called Long Island. I mean, not just one in New York. And real, then I realized, you know, Long Island was right here. And this was a mystery when I saw the, the Bridget Moran because I, I really assumed they meant Mary Moran, which was the recorded first wife of my great-great-grandfather in the obituary back in Ireland. And she died in uh, uh, 1832. So it's, at this point, it's unknown the relationship of Mary Moran, first wife, and Bridget Moran. It could be that they were sisters, relatives, but... <clears throat> The name you could give this was replacement wife, because when I was doing research in Ireland, the archivist in, at the in County Kerry told me that the reference to this kind of situation, they would call them the replacement wife. So, and I know that uh, Moran is a name that's here on the island too, but it's we don't know yet if I'm really connected to the local Morans. And then here's the burial record and for Bridget Moran. Um, the, there were, there were uh, witnesses to the burial, Michael Baker, John Hawkins, and others. And there's no known exact location there at the, where the, 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 the grave is. But of course, you have a very interesting way of you have your uh, stones sorted at the, the old cemetery because, the, like the stones, <coughs> the stones don't all go with the graves. Yeah, so um, it it could be that there was no marker to start with or got used for construction or something. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a little bit. I think this is the closest I was able to get on the picture, but the young boy on the right in this picture uh, is my great great excuse me my great grandfather and, and it's michael Michael Walsh jr there's uh one two three four one two three four five five children there, and then three more are are born here on the island. Now in Michael Walsh's, Michael Walsh Jr.'s uh, obituary says he was born in Kingston, but uh, it could be, um, but he was baptized here at Sacred Heart in, on Wolf Island, so. Um. Oh, there you go, I was able to get closer, so. Um. So, Wolf Islanders. Now I'm going to show you why I probably won't find pinpoint origins of my family in Ireland. 
for the for my line of the Walsh family. Here's why. Because in County Kilkenny, where my Walsh family came from, the Walsh family name was very common. And it could have there were variants to the name. There is Walsh, Welsh, and then there are several other spellings. And I've found several different spellings with uh, documents associated here on the island and census records, U.S. Census and Canadian records. So, you know, it just sort of adds to the, like, are, are they my relatives or not? But um, if enough things line up, it's a pretty good guess. So more than once I've tried to hire a uh, genealogist in Ireland to help me locate, excuse me, the Walsh family but they were obviously honest because they said names like Michael and John Walsh are so common, they wouldn't be able to help me locate it. And there's this uh, uh, thing that's really helpful. It's called a townland. Uh, it's like a, sub it's like a it's really a subdivision uh, of land where farms were located. And if you know this town land, it was probably recorded in baptismal records and other records. And we don't have that information, and I don't expect to ever find it. So that's really one of the reasons why I wanted to come to Wolf Island, because when I found out that there were possibly farms here, it would be really interesting to see where our family lived. And, we, and I did. So this is my father, Martin uh, J. Walsh, Jr. And I heard him say sometime in the late six, uh, 70s or so that we are Bishop Ireland's people, or Bishop John Ireland's people. So what's that all about? So there was a bishop later became archbishop of uh, St. Paul, St. Paul Catholic Diocese in Minnesota. And he established these colonies. I think it's about 10. And my family went to the very first colony in DeGraff, Minnesota. I don't know all the details about how they found out, but I'm going to show you parts of a pamphlet that was being spread around to, to inform Mainly, mainly Catholic and Irish immigrants to, to come from here or wherever, especially the East Coast of, uh, of uh, the United States, and become farmers, or in my case, of our family, continuing, continue to be farmers. And that same time my dad was telling me about we are Bishop Ireland's people is is exactly the same day that I heard about Wolf Island. And I, th I still think there was some confusion that day if, if it was associated with uh, Prince Edward Island, uh, you know, Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> with an E, and with an E. So my dad was also the first known member of the family to return to Ireland. And this is one of his photographs, and it was taken in Galway, uh, near Galway City. And I had posted that picture online, and I got a contact uh, uh, email from uh, a, I guess it was a travel uh, tour guide, and he said he knew the location. And he went there and took a photograph. So this is 1953, Kodachrome. That'd be slides, and so that would be, uh, Kodachrome was used at that time uh, by geographic photographers because it could uh, record really incredible images. So that would be the height of, you know, photography at that time. And my dad also labeled the photographs. He said Galway or something, but, you know, I actually know where this is, <laughs> it, which is pretty incredible now. And uh, I like the old bus. And then here is a picture of Archbishop John Ireland. Of course, my family at that time, he, they knew him as Bishop Ireland. And this is a, 
a cover image of what the this pamphlet looked like that was first issued in um, 1877, and then they updated it a couple years later. But I, I haven't been able to find a copy of that. But it told the immigrants everything, uh, what to do, what to bring, what to expect, uh, that they only wanted farmers and that you needed money to come to Minnesota and uh, you, you couldn't come ha empty handed and that there would be discounts for the railroads, uh, even including Toronto. So this could be how my family left here, and that, but how were they informed? It could be the local clergy, it could have been the local bishop, and uh, Archbishop Ireland also uh, sent out his people, I understand, to do recruiting. So you could have had a recruiter here on the island. And an interesting thing about our Archbishop Ireland, he is also from County Kilkenny, the same place where my, my people are from. Um, not that it matters. Okay, this is a photograph uh, taken by my, my dad in 1948, and it's actually his uncle Henry and uh, his cousin Jerome. And I want to tell you some of the reasons why Archbishop wanted these colonies. So he, he wanted to help the Irish, who are mainly on the East Coast, and they were poor, and there were th there was a lot of uh, racial and uh, religious prejudice, and there were also big riots in Philadelphia. There were church burnings, and this nativism nativism uh, was uh, actually American-born uh, citizens who didn't want new immigrants coming to the United States. It's, you know, that's not a new story. <laughs> so, so there was that going on. And there was also like uh, issues of poverty associated with uh, large urban settings. And the idea was to make the land the, the job and, and livelihood for people to come out to be farmers. And in 1876, Ireland acquired like 75,000 acres of land from uh, James J. Hill. He was a, he had a, a railroad. And it, today, if you were to go and look at the courthouse in Swift County where I live, you will actually see John Ireland's name as, as written as the owner of that land. And then that land was going to be sold again to uh, the new immigrants. And I talked briefly about some of the requirements and you had to have money. You had to have at least uh, $400 at US. And, um, but it was really recommended that you come like with more money if possible, even a thousand dollars, because you needed to set up and have a place, and you needed to buy, you know, all your farming implements and all of that. But you, but what, how this was set differently is that you couldn't come empty-handed. Um, here is a, a little bit of how that brochure looked, and. Uh, it said that uh, Toronto to St. Paul on the train was $23. I did a quick look, and I don't know how accurate it was, but that might have been like $700 today. But they also gave discounts on the railroad for immigrants, and this was something that uh, apparently had been set up with John I Bishop Ireland to help the immigrants get out to St. Paul. And another interesting thing, it says, like, once you get to St. Paul, you need to go to the colonization um, office. And it was located in 6th and Wabash, Wabash Streets in St. Paul. So it was the location of a Catholic school. And I was curious where that was located. And there you go. There is a Tim Hortons there today. <laughs> So 
you would feel at home. I mean, uh, it's a, apparently it's a big ice skating rink. So that's in St. Paul, Minnesota. And there was even details on like when to come, like when was the best time to get the, for immigrants to come. He, in this brochure, it said uh, in May and first week of May, so you can get everything going and the plowing and, and, and all of that. I do know that our family, because uh, it was written that uh, our family arrived on the 19th birthday of my great grandfather, and uh, that would have been in October of 19, excuse me, 1877. So I guess they didn't follow the rules, but maybe they had to update that, you know. So, and the pamphlet was offset with advertisements, which means that it was supporting the, the printing. And, and here's one of the fine thrashers that was available for purchase when you got there. Um, the pamphlet actually said what to bring and what not to bring. It, it, it was very specific about bringing uh, your best linens and um, bed clothes uh, and clothing and nothing more. Because you would have had to pay the freight and, and said, don't bring uh, furniture. So. They, there were actually shanties set up that uh, could be moved uh, onto the location of the farms. And then when they were done with it and their, had their log cabin or other house built, that it would, the, the shanty house would be moved or sold for, for a new immigrant to come. So we're going to look briefly at the Walsh farm. Uh, it's, a, it's on 7th Line Road here, Wolf Island. And it was 100 acres and noted as uh, Lot A, and that's in, um, I, if I have it all right, it was uh, from 1850 to 1877 that my family lived there. And uh, we'll get a little bit closer. Uh, you can see uh, just a little bit more, like the Seventh Line Road. And apparently at one point uh, there were more trees out there probably I don't there's not as many trees there now and this is from uh, about 18 uh, 60s map if I remember right and thanks to uh, Brian McDonald he found the tenant lease papers for Michael Walsh and it was the owner was Thomas Baker from Kingston I understand a wealthy man and uh, obviously if he was a landowner and uh, Michael Walsh is listed second line down. I know it's hard to read, but it, it, it is there. Next we'll go to Patrick Walsh's farm and Pat Walsh. And he was the oldest son of Michael Walsh Sr. And, and I'm going to say he's most likely the son of Mary uh, Moran buried at the old cemetery because I really don't know. And there you go. There's Pat Walsh farm. Uh, Archer Berry and Michael Bryan are some of the names. And then, of course, just above is, I can't make it out, but it might be Arthur McDonald, but a McDonald family. Oh, is it? Okay. And then uh, probably uh, Holiday, John Holiday. So that's uh, Holiday Road and um, Helen's Road or something. Um, so little is known about this Pat Walsh, Patrick Walsh, because the family's really separated because of immigration. And the Patrick Walsh family, they stayed on the island much longer, up until about uh, 1880s, 1890s. And um, that family had five children. And they actually immigrated over a series of years to Philadelphia, not at once. And the reason I know that, from looking at census records. And I've, I've, I've gone on Google Maps to look where they lived in different places and determine uh, uh, where, where their church was. St. Malachi, uh, 
Maliki in uh, Philadelphia. Through Ancestry, I've connected to a family member of, of the Pat Walsh family um, and to have some more details. I, I've, not, I've not met anyone. I'd love to meet someone, but I don't know if that will happen. But uh, I would like one day to go to the cemetery there in Philadelphia um, where they're all buried. Now, here's some interesting things. Not that that wasn't uh, earlier, but... Um, after I got back from Wolf Island, I started studying the old maps um, from Dublin Township. And I thought, well, I wonder who else was on, who else came from Wolf Island. Uh, chain immigration is, it, like, I, uh, my friend, my family went there, I'm, I'm going to go there kind of thing. And I started reading the maps and looking in documents, both in Minnesota and on Wolf Island, and I found some families. Now, these are just the families that I know about, because I just had to stop. I mean, there's, I could keep on going. Some of the family names that have both Wolf Island connections and then back home in Minnesota in Dublin Township in Swift County, Minnesota, are Comerford, Duffy, and O'Reilly, Hawkins, Murphy, McCann, Mc, McDonnell, or McDonnell, as I hear it called here. But in Minnesota, I hear McDonnell. And, of course, Walsh. And these families have ties. Both as, they're, they have Wolf Island ties. And there's the map, and I'm going to blow it up, and it's really... These Wolf Islanders are concentrated in the southwest corner of Dublin Township. And it's a little hard to read but, uh, from where you are, but we have, Mike, we have Michael Walsh next to uh, Mc, McDonnell, J.J. Murphy, he is connected here, uh, James Hawkins, Patrick McDonnell, and, you know, he's got a lot of land. And then Comerford, they're also, they're, they're all in that corner there. And here is one of those people. So this is Susan Hawkins McDonnell, or McDonnell. It's a photo taken in 1922 uh, before she passed away. So her husband was Patrick McDonnell. And she's got a cape on there, and it came from Ireland. And actually today, uh, that cape was donated back home to the Swift County Historical Society, and it's going to be a permanent uh, piece, I understand, if I have it right. And, yeah, so she's one person. So this is J.J. Murphy and Bridget McDonnell. Uh, both with ties back here in Wolf Island, and they get married in Minnesota, and then they have land in Minnesota. There's an, another person I, I didn't mention here, and a, it was a, a son who was a, he became a, a Jesuit priest, and he's from the McDonnell and Walsh line. So, and, the, and these are just the ones that I know about, because I, I, had, I had to just stop because it was taking a long time to connect these people. So now we get to a very interesting piece. Um, at one point, I sent that, that list you just saw previously uh, to Captain Brian Johnson, and I said, you know, look at these names, and he said, oh, yeah, one of those looks familiar. And this is the, the full page of the marriage records from Sacred Heart here. Wolf Island, and I say here in Wolf Island because the name of the church in Murdoch is Sacred Heart. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a little confusing because when I would talk to people about that, trying to sort things out, and they'd say, well, wait a minute, wh which Sacred Heart? So there are two uh, brothers here, and I'm going to pull it up. You, you won't, it'd be hard for you to see it, but... Uh, 
in that same marriage record page, uh, James Duffy uh, marries Alice Johnson in January uh, 1876, and then the James's brother Owen Duffy marries Mary O'Reilly in September 1876. So, you want to know why I'm showing this? Because it'll get very interesting here in a moment. So, I had done some, I had was reading some history in the Swift County Historical Society book about uh, the first child or first person born in Dublin Township uh, was a, a child, a girl named Mary uh, Mary Duffy, and the par her parents were Owen Duffy, and uh, and she's also the first person to die in Dublin Township. And then I I couldn't find this name, and it, apparently uh, Owen Duffy. Uh, takes up a, a new homestead in Kildare Township, and he actually gets what's called a patent to his farm. And so I went to the location. It's really hard to see there, but I'll show you the, homes, the homestead record. And he gets a record, or the patent, to his land. And after realizing these names, and I had heard about the Duffies from Captain Johnson, I realized, you know, he's related to someone that actually, <laughs> well, besides related to all of you, you know, he, he, uh, uh, he has a, he didn't know he had a relative that went to Minnesota, and from my house, it's just three miles away at this, where this farm was. When I found out about the, the farm, there were actually warnings out by the local sheriff's department not to go on those, these dirt roads, county roads. But I did because uh, I wanted to go look at the farm. Uh, I haven't met the people yet, but uh, because I was actually afraid to go down their road because I was thought it was, I had already done too much to like go somewhere to look and it was, and it was in fall, in March, I think. And there's still snow and big potholes so uh, and this is uh, this is what Alice this is Alice Johnson Duffy who was mentioned in those marriage records and uh, so it's the cabin and how this picture came to me because I had read in the in it was either in agricultural census or the enumeration that the log cabin associated with the Walsh farm was eight foot tall. Or no, is that eight foot? I didn't say tall, wide, or, you know, just at eight foot. And so I reached out to Brian. And I said, well, what, what do you think that looks like? And he sends me this picture. And then later he sends me another picture of his great uncle, Howard Duffy. Apparently that's the same cabin. That's Howard Johnson. Um, but Oops, that, but sorry. his Aunt Alice is his great aunt. And I think that's her inside by the window. Yeah, but sorry, I guess I uh, labeled it my wrong. My grandfather Johnny's brother, Howard. So we thought it was 1910, it's 1922, but that's the same shed. Uh, that picture was given to me I think, in the early 90s, late 80s, by uh, Aunt Mary Johnson. And then the other picture with Alice. Uh, outside the cabin, I just saw that maybe a year and a half ago from Liz O'Shea, that they had in their collection. And her exact words were, James and Alice Duffy uh, at the original Johnson homestead, John and, and uh, Ann Boylan, John Johnson, Ann Boylan from Ireland. Alice is the youngest child that came uh, from Ireland. So she stayed on the farm, her, obviously James' brother, which is I didn't know anything about, went to Ireland with your bunch. And, uh, but that was the first picture. Uh, the exact words from Liz O'Shea to the picture she sent me was uh, uh, James and Alice had no children, but her brother Michael did, didn't he, Brian? Well, that's my great-great-grandfather, Michael Johnson, Catherine Sullivan, had uh, Andy Johnson, married Eddie, had Johnny Johnson, 
Mary Violet, my dad, me. So I can see my dad's resemblance in Aunt Alice uh, right there. And that's, um, you, you, it's um, the Duffy household by now, and the boys, meaning my grandfather, my uncle Vinny, my uncle Howard, great uncle, they'd have been over there all the time helping their great aunt because they would have been quite elderly by that time. So I think why it was so significant for me to see these cabins is that you're looking right there if you had people here or somewhere else. That's probably what their log cabin looked like. And I was seeking that out. I was actually going to different museums trying to, to figure out what was this eight foot cabin. And it could have been eight foot high, but I don't know. But uh, I guess if your people were here, it log cabin looked something like that. And that's, that's a really nice glimpse into the past. Just by coincidence, that's Sean Johnson's place today. Just by coincidence. John bought it off the, uh, oh God, uh, um, God, you, you know who it is, Brian. Uh, their son was a priest. Uh, they were both um, Laverty, Frank Laverty's place. So it, 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 out of the family. Enough of my lips. <laughs> so now I'm going to um, take you to 2023. And with the help of Mike Hill, arrow snapper of Kingston, I got his link right there so you can follow him on Facebook. I had reached out to him several months ago to see if we could do some aerial photos or something of the Walsh farm. And I really thought that I'd be walking all the way in this field. But when I got there, I re realized it was a fallow field. And a lot of weeds and whatever crop was the last couple of years was growing. So I did go out to the farm, a seventh line road, and walk on the uh, road that's uh, like a near those windmills, sorry, turbines. So I am going to go to the video itself. Bear with me a moment. your full screen. So I'll just tell you a little bit. There's not going to be really audio with this. What you're going to be seeing is myself, my niece, and we're going to be walking by the field and you're going to see some aerials of the, of the farm. You're going to see the likely location of where the cabin is. Of course, we'll never know. And an aerial view that or a view that I never thought I'd get to experience or see. Yep, there's no audio. And I am telling my niece, there were eight babies born here Probably one person died here, and uh, we should look over there or something. <laughs> and that's more or less the likely location. Uh, maybe, maybe the other side of that hedge but really not known and there you go thank you Mike Hill And of course, if there's a drone <laughs> or Brian Johnson, there's a crowd. Um, that day, uh, Mike Hill, Brian Johnson, my niece, myself, and Bruce Devine.
we were all out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they got to, to watch this uh, in action. It was really pretty cool with the, the drone, to watch the drone. So uh, this is me in Ireland, County Kerry. Uh, by accident, I, I, I couldn't find a hotel when I was going. This was in uh, 2018. So I went to Airbnb, and it was the first time I had used it. And they had a cottage. And at first, I didn't think much of it. Well, I did, because I, I needed a place to stay. And um, I got to stay in this cottage that you see located behind me. But a week or two before I went to uh, Ireland, I sprained an ankle. Uh, I was uh, I, I was a professor, and I fell going out of graduation in you know the robes. <laughs> and I was so determined to go. I think a smart person probably would have waited, but I did. And but it actually probably built a great relationship with the family that owned the cottage and um, it was a really a, a wonderful experience and on this trip I find almost the location of the family farm uh, at that time uh, our family would have been renting they I mean they were Catholic and uh, they wouldn't have been landowners and so in the summer trip, I, I just don't find it. I find it almost. I didn't quite have it. I mean, you're back, these are back roads. They're not labeled with signs. And, and I just, just didn't know where I was really going. So I go back at Christmas time and find, and find it. So... It's uh, really uh, incredible. And it, th that, that same summer, though, I did go to where the f family, uh, to the church and to the graveyard associate with my family. And when I got there, the local historian was l walking his dog. And I say, I'm trying to find a grave associate with my family and the time. And now this is a different line. Uh, it's a Brennan family, not the Walsh family. This is County uh, Carey. And he, he says to me, the historian, you see all those stones there? It means someone is buried there. They're all higgly-piggly. You're not going to find where they're buried. And I had... I was really taken back, and uh, I thought I'd be going to, it would say, you know, so-and-so, my family, but no. So I had kept that in mind. Now, what else was interesting about this graveyard, that it was associated with an abbey and a saint, St. Coleman, that went back to uh, 1530 to 660. So, so my... The grave I can't find with family is associated with a saint. So another thing I just didn't know was going to happen. And what are the chances you show up in Ireland and then the local historian is walking his dog? So uh, that's another you know great thing. And let's see. I'll just move on. This is the farm. It's a uh, townland. Drum carry in it's in, in rural Killarney. A Have any of you been to Ireland? And uh, anyone been to uh, Killarney? And the, have you heard of the Gap of Dunlow? It's a gap uh, between two mountains. It's considered one of the most beautiful locations. Uh, so if you stand on the ridge where this, you can't see it in this view, you stand by the, the cow shed, or, or we call the barn, you can look directly into the Gap of Dunlow. It's just an absolutely breathtaking view. 
So the, pretty much beyond those trees you see there, there was a, a cabin or cottage that would have been associated with our family. Um, they're just in ruins. I mean, there weren't any ruins. They had been, the stones had already been taken and put back into the, to the fences. So, but that's pretty much where my grandmother's family, the Foley's and the Brennan's and the Daly's came from. I mean, it, it's a pinpoint location. Uh, I, I'll never have it, like I said, with the Walsh family. So what do you do with all this findings? So it's really been a quest for me to figure out where my family came from, and, and, and I, I couldn't stop it. <clears throat> and it's sort of uh, a quest to something that you want to achieve and go and see and learn. And <clears throat> in your, some, the thing about a quest is that you're in it, and you don't know you're in it. And I guess I've been doing it for a long time. So here comes the book uh, that'll come out in, uh, later this year. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's called Higgly Piggly Stones, Family Stories from Ireland and Minnesota. I'm, I'm not sure the exact time it'll come out. But, um, excuse me, <clears throat> all this talking. It's, it's a creative nonfiction, so it's based on fact and quest narrative. Because I tell you the story of me <clears throat> seeking out uh, my roots, in, both in uh, Minnesota. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> both in Minnesota and Ireland. So, um, I could read something short. Would you like me? Sure, you have it open. Yeah. <clears throat> so, kind of losing my voice. Uh, so this is, uh, I say I live on the edge of the world because when the storms come, the, the blizzards come in, in the winter, there's a, like a, a curtain of snow that just comes around my edge of, the, the, of Murdoch and you can't see anything. And you, oh yeah, and you can't go anywhere. <laughs> so this is, this is sort of like a, a poem, prose poem. Uh, Murdoch on the edge of the world. And th these are some details that I are from a watercolor sketch I made a while ago. All buried, all buried in this cemetery have their feet pointing east. Look for the large Irish Celtic crosses with, and find the priests. Father Walsh, with his Irish walking stick, looks west, all ready for the second coming of Christ. A stand of trees surrounds the outermost boundary, with railroad cars passing by homes and businesses. Tiny corn grows on the edge of Murdoch. Bell Tower of the Catholic Church stands proud. Chimes sound at the top of, and the bottom of the hour. The water tower peaks out just above the tree line, but best viewed looking north from the post office. The grain elevator is the skyscraper, crops sold and sent out by rail, then to Asia. Hidden from the stand of trees is home, just one house from the cemetery. The view the skyline view looking east of Murdoch is complete. Little is changing. Absolutely perfect view. And yes, I live like one house from the cemetery. <laughs> so, you know, we know, I know where I'm going. Um, I'm not sure I can go on and read any more. Uh, you want me to read? <laughs> um, I could read about my grandfather in the fire. Okay. 
So you saw my picture of my grandfather there. And uh, what I'm about to read is based upon an interview that my, bro my brother did. Uh, we both did the same interviews, but my brother Paul did the interview before my dad had, or grandfather had a stroke. And I, so my, my interview was, you know, hardly anything. It was my aunt answering my grandfather's questions. So let me just take one more uh, drink. And, you know, there's been a lot of fires, so I thought this in Canada, and we've, we've known about them <laughs> where, where we live, so this is somewhat associated. So, during the interviews in the 1980s, Grandpa said he was born in Section 32 in Dublin Township in Swift County, in a house moved out from DeGraff by his grandfather, Michael Walsh Sr., I would stumble when Grandpa, Grandpa re referenced a section of the township instead of a street. I understand now the significance of a section of land to be about a quarter mile. That's about 36 sections of town, in a townland. The house Grandpa mentions was uh, at his birth was actually a shanty used for early se settlers. So I'm going to tell you about, uh, <clears throat> it was a big fire. It's called the Great Hinkley Fire of 1894 in Minnesota. The Great Hinkley Fire of 1894, located near Hinkley, Minnesota, started September 1st, uh, burning 350,000 acres and about 400 square miles. Lost the fire were about 418 men, <clears throat> women, and children, and countless animals, livestock, uh, wildlife were lost were also lost at this at this time there was a steady loss of moisture in central Minnesota reported from 1891 to 1894 by the St. Paul Weather Bureau grandpa was seven years old at the time of the Hinkley fire living with his family in rural uh, Dublin Township Hinkley was 150 miles away, northeast of rural Dublin Township. Grandpa shares his memories of the fire. <clears throat> I remember the Hinkley fire. On September 1st, 1894, a neighbor came over to our farm near Murdoch to borrow a wagon during the harvest. When he went outside, the smoke was so thick in the air from the fire when the fire came up north that his eyes just burned from the smoke. The farm grandpa is likely talking about in Dublin Township is now, it was located not far from the Chippewa County line. In 1987, while I was writing a story about my grandfather's 100th birthday for a local newspaper, I wrote about the smoke from the Hinkley fire. The editor at the time said that it just was not possible for the smoke to come all the way to Murdoch, and he removed the sentences related to my grandfather talking about the fire. I remember one. I remember more than one of the facts about the fire and what my grandpa said. The editor shook his head in disbelief, yet published the story. So, July 29th, 2021, the sky and air in Murdoch were filled with smoke as far away as Canada. <laughs> <laughs> My house and yard were surrounded in a haze of orange and yellow smoke from Canada, from Canadian forest fires, and I needed to wear a face mask to go outside. I have no doubt what my, about the story Grandpa shared about the Great Hinkley fire as I've experienced firsthand the smoke from the fires from Canada much further than Hinkley. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, it was hard for that editor to understand the significance of, of the fire then. And now I think we all know 
that really happened. I mean, more than likely happened. Um, let's see if, uh, I could, uh, I could do portion of something from the farm or do, do you have time or? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm taking you back to the farm again. And this is, again, Dublin Farm. It's called Dublin Farm because it's located in Dublin Township. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Dublin Farm, Murdoch, Minnesota, October 6, 2018, Swift County. Now I stand on this sacred land at Dublin, at Dublin Farm with the remains of corn husk and stalks just harvested a few days ago by a tech-savvy farmer, Steve Collins. With aerial views and, and details available at his hand in his, on his iPad. In the distance, I can hear a grain elevator likely from the Collins farm, filling a silo with corn and soybeans. Grain is sometimes stored before it's off to market and gone and has gone to the local elevator. And in Murdoch, it's the glacial plains <clears throat> in Minnesota. Windy and overcast, low layers of stratus clouds are gray and white, blanket the heavens, giving a dark appearance that rain is sure to follow. The horizon to the west appears to be almost flat, except for slight rises in the distance. The land is open, almost free of all air, uh, barriers, as this is prairie land. What I'm really looking at is the remains of a bottom of a glacial lake, referred by archaeologists as Lake Benson, once covering most of Swift County during the place to see a uh, period about 13,000 years ago, according to the local archaeology lab at the Minnesota uh, State University, Moorhead. The dirt in, at Dublin Township is dark and black prairie land soil, uh, ranging from well-drained areas to poorly drained areas, adding to the complexity of planting of farming and uh, soybeans and corn. It's not until I think about the ice that once covered this land that brings the stones from the north, from Canada, or unknown locations. Uh, older homes in Swift County have foundations made of filled stones, including my home in Murdoch. And once the location of a flour mill. It was called the Murdoch Milling Company. The stone home of Joseph and Anna Shaft served as a location for the first Catholic church, and it was said to be in, uh, as early as 1880 that uh, the first priest, or one of, or father, of Valentine Stemmler, from, he had uh, 37 German Catholic families, and and other, and said uh, mass in private homes. The stones uh, from the fields are part of the Sacred Heart Catholic Church history, uh, because the first church was made of stones, very much like you probably would have found in Ireland. So, I'm just going to stop there. But. Uh, Questions? <laughs> there you go. Could you explain the pictures on the cover of your book? Oh, sure. Good question. I was going to talk about that. So, the first picture on the left, it's either the, the marriage of my uh, grandfather or his brother. Uh, they, two, two Welsh brothers married two uh, Foley sisters. 
their children became uh, double first cousins. Uh, the picture upper right corner, uh, my grandmother, uh, my grandfather, Walsh, my mother, my brother Paul, and baby Jeanette. <laughs> the, the two babies uh, in the middle left are my aunts, uh, Margaret and Agnes. The picture lower right is a, my, my father, Martin. And the picture of the house is my house. It, I think it was dated to about, uh, with that uh, car, about the 30s or 40s. Uh, it was kind of hard to determine the, the car. But yeah, that's, that's my, uh, my house. It, it pretty much looks the same. In that picture, it shows a, like a sleeping porch. Uh, I've got something like that now. <laughs> I, I have a studio that was meant only for work. And then I realized with my, my new uh, uh, fan, I, I put a bed in there. And I sleep there in the summer. <laughs> so it's a modern sleeping porch. So yeah, so that, that's, that's the, the book cover. Any other uh, questions? Uh, the horses, I photographed them last night. The Clydesdales, it's a, I think it's George, George Casey's, so. Very common sight over here. Is it, it wasn't for me, yes. How helpful was uh, things like ancestry and those kind of things in your search? Yeah, so it was helpful. I, at one point at the beginning, I had a paid uh, subscription. But there are other sources that you don't have to pay for. And some of those are the most valuable ones. Uh, there's. Uh, I actually, if I have on my website, uh, JeanetteWalsh.com, if you go to my website, I have a bunch of uh, resources there. But one of the websites I find most helpful is called Family Search. And you have to first register and then search. That's where I started finding church documents associated with Wolf Island. That's where I found the marriage record to Kingston, um, uh, St. Mary's Cathedral for the marriage uh, in, in 1857. That was, that I find that uh, the best, uh, one of the best resources. Uh, I would go with the free one. Well, it's interesting when you were saying, what's the name of the Tammy Sturt? Tammy Sturt. My wife, who I've lived with for 35 years, and whispers in my ears and says, I'm registered on that. Yeah. I never knew that about Yeah. <laughs> I, I was introduced to it by a, like a professional uh, genealogist, and she, she had told me about it. And yeah, there's, but there are some things you can find on Ancestry, but you can't, but I find it, I can pretty much get what I want, or, you know, the, the, I find there's a lot there, and it's free. Now, they do have some something paid there, but um, you really, you can do the search, so. And then the, the other really helpful sources are, uh, like, historical societies, like the Wolf Island Historical Society, or, or like, if you're going back to Ireland, uh, I mean, searching in Ireland, some of their... Uh, Libraries are helpful, and there's a, 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 a an Irish uh, website. It's an official website that it contains uh, Catholic uh, religious records and civil records. Uh, I was able to find details for a baptism for my family in Kerry, uh, County Kerry, there. So. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Any more questions? I think I'm cleaning that Duffy Stone uh, Sacred Heart right now. Oh. So when I get it cleaned up, I'll take a picture. Oh, thank you. you can hardly use it. Yeah, oh, that'd be great. The Johnson name is spelled wrong. And in the, uh, in the, um, uh, or, uh, the booklet, or the book of Sacred Heart Cemetery, Stonecutter, we believe, made a mistake. So when it does come up, say it's nothing to do with you. It's an actual, I think the H is before and or whatever it is when I could read it years ago. So that's something important, like, to not overlook. Uh, the variance of your name. Yes. Don't think of it as necessarily spelled wrong, but differently. And if you can get enough names in the location that are associated, it might be your family. Because I, for a while, I overlooked, you know, the Welsh and, and other spellings. But those are maybe your people. And, and why are there different spelling? It's who wrote it. Maybe your family, they didn't know how to spell it, or whoever was making the document told you it would be spelled that way, or, or you know, you don't, you don't know. But, uh, yeah, the, just Walsh all over the place, you know, but it's the, it's just, it's just how it is. Which makes it really confusing when you're trying to, like, find family history. So if I could give you any advice, like just if you're looking for a family history, uh, don't, one, don't get up. Look at all the possibilities of what your family name could be spelled and, you know, don't overlook those. And try to make sure uh, you keep records. Uh, it could, you, you could be searching in the wrong family. Um, because that's how I, I received a family tree by someone years ago searching our family, the Walsh family, for his wife, only to find out it was the wrong family. But he did an incredible job <laughs> sorry, doing all this research. Uh, so if there's no other questions, I'll thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time.